Jack, when, when did you first join the Met Office? Oh, 1941. That's getting on to 50 years ago. Things have changed since then, haven't they? The observations they used to make in those days, were they as sophisticated as now? Oh, not nearly so, no. They were very, very primitive, really, when you compare them with the way we do things now. For instance, we, very few people had an anemometer, so yeah. you had to estimate what the wind strength was, and you did that by mostly just standing in front of the wind and letting it blow on you and uh, you blow on you let you you learned well, so what's this wind like well this is about a force five or four six that uh, that's coming over the hedge here now and and you would get used to that sort of thing uh, but also you could use well, most of us were on airfields and you could use a, a drogue that was somewhere there a wind sock on the airfield and if it was sloping like that it was a force three and something like that was a force four and if it was out straight and flapping about it was seven or four seven or eight so above the horizontal was, was wild oh yes absolutely but you couldn't get into uh, hurricane force or anything like that and also you couldn't be absolutely sure of what the speed was but most people nowadays have anemometers and they could tell you exactly to a knot what it is you know what about high level uh, winds how would well, you find them out further up it was uh, really antiquated and now turns out to be funny we used a thing called a nephoscope which was rather like a garden rake stood on its end with the prongs of the rake sticking up into the sky and we had two bits of string we could guide this round into any direction we fancied and we stood with legs apart and looked at these prongs and pulled them around until the cloud that we were looking at was scudding just above the tops on the points and then we knew that the rake was pointing in the same direction as the cloud was going so we had a little alidade on the bottom that told us which direction the wind was at that height and then timing from one point that was sticking up to the next one we could time this on a stopwatch and then calculate using trigonometry how fast that uh, cloud was going but it had a couple of drawbacks of course one of them was that you first had to estimate how high the cloud was <laughs> and that was just an estimate and you could be well out so that one of your arms of trigonometry was wrong to start with and the other thing you had to do was to keep your head exactly still while you were timing <laughs> from the middle point to the next one and if you moved your head a little bit the timing was all wrong of course so that it was a dreadful estimate this but this was how we uh, tried to find out what the wind speed and direction was at height well these observations then were obviously in, in error to say the least how on earth could you forecast what the weather was going to do in the future well that was also in error because the original uh, observation was in error but it wasn't as far out as you would expect it to be but you didn't have satellites you didn't have computer models predicting various fields of weather elements no and we didn't know very much about the atmosphere either because you couldn't probe into the atmosphere as you've just said using the various things that we've got now the only probes that we could make in those days were mostly done by airplanes and airplanes spitfires in fact in my early days we had a couple of them stationed at different parts of the country that would take off and sort of circle above their spot into the air and they could get up to about 24 25,000 feet and all the way up at various levels they were taking uh, temperature readings not wind readings just temperature readings so we could get a temperature reading uh, graph right through the atmosphere which we use now to this day to see if things are if, if the air is stable or unstable and that sort of thing so we had those but only in two places in the country and most of the planet is ocean so I mean how could you tell what was upwind in the Atlantic well before the satellites came along there was very little of that various ships sent in reports and that sort of thing but there were great great gaps over the oceans of the world and uh, in the third world and uh, over the poles of course where you didn't know exactly what was happening and so you'd have the odd occasional ship that would tell you something was happening out there but until uh, something coming in from the Atlantic arrived in uh, the western part of Ireland you simply didn't know what was happening then we also manually drew weather charts in those days and put the isobars on ourselves everything was local there was nothing done centrally as is the case nowadays and uh, you know now and again you say on telly that uh, 
if, if the isobars are close together, the wind is strong and vice versa. Well, you can actually measure the speed of the wind from those isobars. And so we would measure how fast the weather was coming along once it hit Ireland and then have a guess as to what, it would, what time it would get here or which day it would get here. That's all right for London, but it's a bit of sort of bad for Belfast. It must be on them before you've got well, time to right. forecast it. Well, that's right. Was, it was much easier to forecast for stuff coming from the Atlantic from places on the east coast of England yeah. than it was on the west coast of Ireland, say. Uh, but it worked for D-Day, didn't it? Because apparently the forecast worked out quite well for the Normandy coast. Well, yes, but D-Day was a few years on then, and we were a little more sophisticated. And also, uh, when D-Day was coming along, and any special uh, forecast that was required, we set to and made sure that we had lots of, uh, of information that we didn't otherwise have. We were, it, during the war, strange to say, uh, that was in the 40s, mm. a lot better off in one respect than we are now, because we had no fewer than something like 10 or 12 Royal Air Force squadrons that were equipped with big aeroplanes that flew 500 miles mm. out into the Atlantic and did a couple of soundings up to about 20,000 feet on the way and down from there. And these gave us lots and lots of information about what was coming in from the Atlantic. This was uh, during the 40s all this was developed and that was the beginning of getting a lot of information from the Atlantic. But of course nowadays we don't get that because we've got satellites. And, and how have you like seen that. it develop over the years? What's been the greatest asset to weather forecasters? Well, the, 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 the biggest two developments undoubtedly have been satellites and computers, of course, because as the, in, in, in those days uh, we couldn't forecast any further ahead than at the most 24 hours, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, with computers, uh, uh, you quite happily forecast something like seven days ahead and mm -hmm. have a little guess at what, what it's going to be like in the, in the next seven days. And uh, the general trend of the weather that happens over those seven days because of computers is quite right. It might be wrong on a Monday to say what it's going to be like on Friday afternoon, but at least you can give the trend of the weather. Whereas in those days, because of these, uh, we didn't have the, the computer facility, uh, you couldn't forecast more than 24 hours ahead at the most. Yeah. But did you, what about any sort of um, weather law then? Could you resort to that sayings, any red sky at night type of saying that might work? No, uh, it, it, red sky at night and all of the, the sort of scientific weather law is based on science anyway. Mm. Scientists were all this time, incidentally, uh, bringing things further forward and, uh, and understanding the weather far more than they mm. did before. When I first came in, you have to remember that the frontal uh, system theory was only about 20 years old. It, it, people accept the frontal system theory now, but it was only about 20 years old then. And we were uh, getting to know more and more about it as we were able to probe deeper through the troposphere and the atmosphere. Uh, before we could probe up there, there was no way in which we could, uh, or the, the scientists, could find out what made the weather work. We mm. didn't know anything about jet streams, for instance. Yeah, Not a thing about jet streams or their relationship to frontal systems. So until we could probe very high into the atmosphere, well, we, we never learned anything about jet streams. In fact, I can remember that aeroplanes used to come back from various places uh, when they started to be able to fly up to about 20,000 feet, and navigators would say, the winds were a little bit stronger than you forecast. And the forecasters of the day, uh, I was just a basic grey chap then, would say when the navigator had gone, uh, fancy this guy blaming his bad navigation on uh, my winds, little knowing that the winds could change uh, in a jet stream very, very much from one place to uh, another place a short distance away. We just didn't, didn't know anything about it.